Hey guys, welcome back to part five of the series where I am trying to build an incubator from scratch. If you have seen my previous videos, you'd know that we were done with half of the circuit before, but in this video, I'm going to be remaking that part as well. The circuit was fine in that video, but it was just a bit messy. So I'm hoping to make a better and neater version of that circuit. I am also going to show you a motor controller circuit with relays and an AC heater controller that we will be able to control with Arduino. This video is going to be a long one because I wanted to complete the whole circuit in one video so that we can move on to the programming part quicker. Just a note before the video begins that I have personally tested the circuit and made sure that there was nothing wrong with it. The reason I'm saying this right now is because we are going to be working with AC in this video. So just wanted to say to be careful Try to use a fuse in series with AC as well as DC since we are going to be dealing with high power and there is a possibility of shock as well as damage to your microcontroller. If you just want the schematic and don't want to watch the video, I have included the schematic link and all the links you will need to make the circuit. That includes videos from other channels explaining the concept used in this video in much more detail. So be sure to check out the description after you watch the video. So just as usual, going to add an Arduino Nano in the sketch by searching in the Easy EDA library. It doesn't need to have a proper PCB footprint since we are only planning on using it inside the schematic. I will not be making this PCB compatible schematic because that would just take more time. Maybe we can do it in the next part or maybe in the next version, but not in this video. So I'm going to choose a 2-pin 2.54 inches connector that is a standard Arduino connector by the way uh, and place it inside the sketch. So you are going to be noticing a difference in wiring in this video. This is because I'm using net labels or net ports in this video. The way they work is that if you have net labels connected to let's say five different terminals then they are all going to be connected together when we go in the PCB view. Provided that all of them have the same name of course. So I'm going to choose a net port here and name it 12 volts and connect it to the terminals of the connector. This is where we're going to plug in our 12 volt power supply and I'm going to connect the other terminal of the connector to ground. This ground is going to be common ground that is common with the 5 volt power supply but not at all common uh, with uh, anything other than that. Because we're going to be using AC, I just want to clarify that AC's ground and 12 volt and 5 volt ground is going to be separate. So I'm going to go ahead and select any fuse and name it 5 amp fuse. Again, since we are not going to worry about the PCB part in this video, footprints or choosing the right symbol is not really that important. And here I am going to put the fuse in line with the 12 volt. As I have said earlier, try to be careful with the circuit. I'm using a fused plug for the AC and for DC I'm using a power supply that has internal short circuit protection. If you follow my circuit exactly the way it is, you have nothing to worry about. But if you want to experiment and try new things, then the fuses and short circuit protection will be important. Now I'm quickly going to choose the real-time clock and connect it to Arduino. I have a DS3231, but you can use DS1307 RTC as well since they both use I2C protocol. But a few changes in the code are necessary for it to work. If you can't find your RTC in the library, just choose a 4-pin connector since they all need 4 pins to work. I am going to connect ground to common ground and I'm going to use a 5 volt port just to be explicit. We could have used VCC port, but then again, they are just names. The more explicit you are, the better. Just like I connected the 12 volt port to the connector, I am going to make another port and connect it to SCL and SDA pins of the RTC connector. And I'm going to name them SDA and SCL. Just copy the port themselves and paste anywhere in the circuit and connect it to pin A4 and A5. If you are using another microcontroller, the I2 pins might be different. So check the datasheet to know which pins are which. 
I haven't done a very good job of pulling these two pins up to 5 volts, but I am sure you can do it better than me. I am just going to speed this up a little bit until I have positioned the pull up resistors correctly. If you recall from the previous video, I said that we are going to be using a 16x12 LCD that works on I2C. Well, I found something better and cheaper and frankly prettier. We're going to be using this OLED. There isn't much difference when it comes to its connection since both use I2C and are 5 volt compatible. Here I have chosen in the schematic a nice and neat picture of the OLED, but you can use any 4 pin connector and it will work the same. I am just going to connect the SDA and the SCL ports to its terminals and this is where you can see the benefits of the NET system. Instead of connecting all the SCL and SDA lines directly to the Arduino with physical wires, we can just connect the labels instead and it will do the same job. If you want to know more about I2C, you can find it in the description. I will link a very good video where you will learn more about it. For the temperature sensor, I am going to be using two sensors, one DHT22 and the other DS18B20, which is commonly used in aquariums and whatnot because it's waterproof and because it's readily available. So that's a plus point. The reason I'm using two sensors is because that I want to take an average of these two sensors when I'm taking a measurement. This will give me a more accurate result than using a single sensor. Also, if one of them stops working, you will have an, the other one doing its job until you can find a replacement. So I am going to choose a 3 pin connector since it works on one wire technology. That means we only need one wire to read its data and we can attach many more sensors to that one wire. This does need a pull up resistor on its data line. So I am going to pull that line up to 5 volts using a 4.7 kilo ohms resistor. And now I'm just going to connect uh, its port to Arduino's pin, just the way we did with SDA and SCL. Now I'm going to choose a three pin connector for the DHT22. We could use a four pin connector for the DHT22, but since we are not using uh, one of these pins, why not save the space and go for three pin connector instead? It's the same circuit as in the previous video, so I'm going to speed this up a bit. Note that a 10 kilo ohm resistor is needed on its data line to pull it high. Now let's move on to connecting some fans to the circuit. We will be using two fans for this incubator. One will be continuously running, which will help the air move inside the incubator, making it a forced air incubator. This will give us uniform temperature values inside the incubator. The other fan is going to be used to move the air out of the incubator or maybe bring the air in, depending upon the situation. We will see which route we want to go later. This will help us reduce the temperature as well as reduce the humidity if you live in a humid place, where the humidity is naturally higher than needed for the incubator. So just like the previous video, I'm going to be using 2N2222 transistors, which are NPN transistors. They might look small, but they are enough for the job since each one of them can conduct around 800 milliamperes max. The circuit isn't going to be any different uh, than the previous video. We are going to switch the ground lines of load. So let me just go ahead and select a 2N2222 transistor from the Easy EDA library. I'm going to connect the common ground to the transistor's emitter. Now connect its collector to one terminal of the load, or in this case, one terminal of the connector. Now connect the connector's other terminal directly to 12 volt port. The one thing that I forgot to mention in the previous video was that transistors can be made to conduct a certain amount of current from collector to emitter by choosing different values for base resistors. I will not go into much detail, but we need a resistor that will limit the current of its base under 20 milliamperes. Since an Arduino can only source 40 milliamperes from its digital pins, 20 milliamperes is kind of like the safe area. And in addition to that, we need a current value that will allow the required current for fan. 
in each case it's different so for example in this dehumidifier fan example I know that these computer fans take about 200 milliamperes and can reach up to 500 milliamperes when they initially start so we need a resistor value that will allow around 400 milliamperes from collector to emitter and according to my calculations that value comes up to be around 1.2 kilo ohm but you can go a bit higher or lower depending on your needs if you want to know more about this topic i will link a great video from applied sciences channel now i'm going to make a port for this resistor and connect the same port to the arduino spin we have talked about reducing your incubator's humidity if you live in a humid place but we haven't yet talked about increasing the humidity level of your incubator if you live in a dry place fortunately increasing the humidity is much easier than decreasing the humidity so I'm going to mention a few ways to do that first you can either put a glass of water or a plate of water which has a big surface area water vapors will escape from glass of water and increase the humidity second you can boil water inside your incubator if you want to increase the humidity faster but that will also generate more heat third this last solution is kind of cheap but also good enough for us we can use a cheap 5 volt humidifier to increase the humidity of the incubator at will we are going to be using a donut shaped humidifier that is quite popular nowadays and the good thing about it is that it runs off of 5 volts and consumes about 500 milliamperes so that brings it just under our transistor's current limit of 800 milliamperes which means we can use it this current rating is very close to the current limit of the transistor and if this had been a continuous running load i wouldn't choose this transistor and would rather go with a mosfet but because we are really going to use this and for short periods of time i think this transistor will be fine for the job i'm going to finish this humidifier circuit by connecting the emitter to the common ground and making the port for it and connecting that port to the Arduino spin so according to my calculations this resistor value needs to be around 820 ohms but you can go a bit lower if you want it's time to make the continuous fan circuit and for this I'm going to choose a bit of a different route I'm going to use an n channel MOSFET that has a low resistance value between its source and drain pins to generate as less heat as possible so for now I will choose IRF520 since that is the one I have lying around but when I can I will change it to something better because this is continuous load and we want control over it I will use this instead of a transistor for testing purposes we can use a 2N222 transistor in place of a MOSFET but when we are making the actual incubator we need to remember to change it so it turns out just like in transistors you need a gate resistor but for entirely different reasons so MOSFETs gate work as a capacitor we need to feed current to it so that it charges once it does it shorts the source and drain with a low resistance so if we don't have the resistor in series the capacitor or gate is going to try to source as much current as it can from the Arduino pin and that's not good for the microcontroller okay since it works as a capacitor unless you discharge it it will contain that charge for a while so in order to quickly turn the MOSFET off and on as we need to do in PWM needs we need a discharge resistor and that discharge resistor will be connected to ground so that when the signal is off the capacitor will automatically discharge and MOSFET will turn off if you want to know more about this topic I will link a great video that explains and demonstrates this in detail so I'm just going to put a random value resistor going to gate of the MOSFET and pulling the gate MOSFET down to ground with another random value resistor I'm going to change these later after calculations of course but I think 330 ohm gate resistor and a 10k pull down resistor should work fine 
and it has worked fine for me before. So I'm just going to make the port connections of the continuous fan and move on to the next bit. With the continuous fan circuit done, let's move on to the buzzer circuit. Remember to get a 12 volt simple buzzer and not an active buzzer. We need the buzzer for any alarms, feedback or when things go wrong. The circuit isn't going to be any different than any other circuit except the different resistor value because it consumes different amount of current. So I'm going to speed this up. Uh, now let's make the motor controller. So you might be saying you have already showed us this circuit in the previous video. So why make it again? Well, the answer is that when I thought about it, some places didn't have a module as fancy as that. They, they just don't have the shops that sell these things. Some people might need to order it from China and wait for it to arrive. So I thought, let's go with something that's readily available at any electric store in almost all parts of the world. So then I found the circuit. It's quite a simple edge bridge made with two relays and it can handle very high currents while being isolated from the rest of the circuit. I will explain how it works, but first let me wire it up. Let's go into the Easy EDA library and search for a 5 volt relay. That means a relay that will turn on when 5 volt is applied to its coil terminals. And of course it can, it can handle uh, AC voltage as well as up to 10 amperes of current. And I think I'm going to use this one. Let's go ahead and grab a 2 pin connector which will be our connector for the motor. And let's connect the connectors terminals to the common of both relays. Since the coil is what turns the relay on and off, I'm going to use a transistor to switch the relay instead of connecting it directly to the Arduino. So I'm going to connect one of the terminals of the coil to the collector of the transistor and connect the ground to the emitter of the transistor. I'm going to repeat the same for the other relay. Now I'm going to put in a random resistor value at the base of the transistors, but I think 1K should work fine. Okay, let's make a copy of the 12 volt port and place it right in the middle of the relays. And make another ground port and place it right beside the 12 volt. Now connect the normally open terminals of both relays to the 12 volt port and connect the normally closed terminals of both relays together to the ground port. Okay, finally, now that that is done, let me explain how it works. As you can see, the motor's terminals are connected to the connector going to the common of the relays. That common will switch when the relay is turned on by the transistor. So the default state is off for this relay, meaning both common pins are connected to normally connected pins. So if you trace the line, you see that in both terminals of the motor, the voltage is zero volts. So the motor will not spin. Now when we turn on one of the relay and let the other be in the off state, the one that we turned on now has its common pin attached to the normally open pin and is now 12 volts. Now if you trace the lines, you see that one terminal of the motor is 12 volts and the other is 0 volts since it is connected to the off relay. This creates a potential difference and the motor begins to move in one direction. If we now turn off the turned on relay and turn on the turned off relay, basically repeating what we did earlier, now we see that the terminal that was previously 0 volts is now 12 volts and the relay that was 12 volts is now 0 volts. That means that the voltage has been switched. But wait, what happens if we turn on both relays at once? Basically nothing, because when both terminals of the motor are at 0 volts or 12 volts, there is no potential difference. Hence the motor doesn't spin. Okay, let's move on from this circuit now. Now let's try to make a heater controller circuit for DC heaters. It's going to be similar to the continuous fan circuit, 
but there are a few differences. The differences are that this will require a lot of current. So we need to make sure to completely turn the MOSFET on very fast. And since we are going to control the heater's intensity, we need to connect it to the PWM pins of the Arduino. Let's connect the common ground to the source of the MOSFET and connect one terminal of the load connector to its drain and the other terminal of the connector to 12 volts directly. Then I'm going to put a discharge resistor connected to ground. Okay, so now I'm going to be making the triac circuit which is going to be controlling the AC heater. So now you might be thinking why I'm making circuits for both AC and DC. Well, it is to give you the option to choose whichever you want. By no means am I suggesting to put both capabilities in one circuit, as that would be useless. So just like in motor controller, I showed you the circuit with the motor driver and I also showed you the one with the relays. It's up to you which one to choose and which parts you have available. Similarly, I already showed you the DC heater controller circuit, but I'm going to make this AC heater controller circuit as well. And there might be a few reasons that you would want to go with the AC heater controller circuit instead of DC. First, you will save some money by not buying a 12 volt power supply rated for high currents. Second, you can control powerful loads that require a lot of current. So enough of that and let's move on to making the circuit. Here I will be using the zero voltage cross detector and a photodiac which is controlled by the Arduino and which controls the triax gate. I will explain how the circuit works when I am done making it and I will also link some good sources for more information. You can watch that if you want to know more about it. I'm just going to draw a box over here to say that this is where the AC signal is. Let's go into EasyEDA library and search for MCT2E which is a optocoupler this will be used as a zero voltage cross detector. What does that actually mean? Well, simply put, we are detecting the zero voltage point in an AC waveform, which is right in the middle of the graph. More on that later. Now, because we need the AC waveform to detect the zero voltage crossing point, we can just connect our mains to a full bridge rectifier. In the circuit, I'm using an IC that will do the rectifying for me, but in my circuit that I made on the breadboard, I'm using simple diodes to make a full bridge rectifier. Anyway, let's go ahead and choose a full bridge rectifier. Let's select a two pin connector and connect it to the AC terminals of the rectifier. Now let's connect the positive DC part of the rectifier to the anode or pin one of the MCT2E through a 1K ohm resistor and connect the cathode or pin 2 of the MCT2E to the ground of the bridge rectifier. We are doing this to isolate the ground from the rest of the ground in our circuit. And since we have an LED in the optocoupler, we need to limit the current. So here I am using 47 kilo ohm resistors that's rated for 1 watt between the AC connector and the rectifier pins. Here I am just experimenting with few connections I was actually following a circuit diagram made by a very good YouTuber, TechieSims. I will link to his video and article in the description below. I was also using another source, his channel name is ElectroNoops and he has an article also. By improvising and mixing both of these codes and uh, circuit diagrams, I was able to come up with a circuit that worked perfectly for me. Now I'm connecting the collector or the pin 5 of the MCT2E directly to the 5 volts and connecting the emitter or pin 4 to the ground pin through a pull down resistor of 1 kilo ohms. Now I'm connecting a wire directly to the pin 4 or the emitter of the MCT2E and then connecting that wire directly to Arduino's pin 2. Why pin D2 specifically? Well, that is a hardware interrupt pin which has the capability to sense fast changing signals and then there is a function built within Arduino which tells Arduino what to do if a change occurs in this pin and what function to execute.
We can't use any other pins because we need fast reaction time and there are only two hardware interrupt pins in Arduino Nano. If you are using another board, do check the available pins and use that. Now this is our zero voltage crossing circuit done. Now we need to make the triac driver circuit with a diac. If you don't know what a diac is or a triac is, just think of them as transistors for AC. They have a gate which when turned on or given voltage to it just shorts the uh, two terminals which switches the AC. So for this part we need a MOC3021 IC but you can use any IC that is photodiac which will drive the triac circuit. Photodiac isn't actually a word I'm just saying that to refer to a diac that has a capability of switching the diac with LED or with optocoupler. The point is that the IC should isolate the AC from the Arduino signal completely. I'm going to connect the 330 ohm resistor to pin 1 of the MOC and then connect a port called triac gate to the resistor and will then later connect that port directly to Arduino. Don't worry, there is still complete isolation inside the IC. Pin 2 of the MOC will be connected to the common ground or the Arduino ground specifically. Just be careful and don't connect it to the bridge rectifier ground. Pin 3 is not connected. The more isolation we have from the AC circuit the better. While we are at it, let's make ports for the live and neutral terminals of the AC because we will need it later and it's better than connecting physical wires. I'm also going to connect the appropriate ports to the 47 kilo ohm resistors. Now we connect the neutral to the pin 6 of the MOC through a 1 kilo ohm resistor. Then on pin 4 of the MOC we connect directly the triac pin. In my case I'm using a BT136. Now I'm going to connect the main terminal 2 directly to one of the terminals of the load connector and now connect the AC neutral port to the main terminal 1 of the triac. Then connect the other terminal of the load connector directly to AC live port. This completes the circuit. Now that we are done with the complete circuit, I'm going to clean the schematic a bit and connect any wires or ports that I forgot to connect. There is another problem that we might need to tackle. For example, when the circuit is complete and we replicate it in a breadboard, or make a PCB out of it, if the microcontroller hangs or there is something wrong with it and if you need to restart it, you will either need to pull the whole plug out or open the box where the circuit board is to press the reset button. So let's make resetting easier on the Arduino by connecting the reset pin through a button to ground. That means when the button is pushed, the reset is directly connected to ground and this will automatically reset the Arduino. And we can pull this button out in front of the case so whenever we need to reset we can just do it easily. Just for the final touches, just to make the debugging easy if something goes wrong, I'm going to add three status LEDs. One will be directly connected to 5 volt line, the other with 12 volt line, and the other LED will be connected to one of the pins of the Arduino. The 5 volt and 12 volt pins will tell us if there is voltage in those lines and the pin on Arduino will help us identify an error. For example, if one of the temperature sensors stops working, we can turn on this LED to tell the user to check the OLED screen menu where the error is explained in detail. This way the user doesn't need to worry about looking at the screen 24-7 and the LEDs can be seen across the room. One more thing that I forgot to add is the rotary encoder. So in previous episode I said I will be using three or four buttons as an interface for the menu but then because of its debounce issues and scarcity of pins I had to find another way. So this rotary encoder can be turned like a knob or potentiometer left or right. There is also a built-in button in it so that when the user wants to enter a menu, he can just click it. So this is a 3-in-1 solution and it looks kind of neat with the OLED side by side. I will leave the rotary encoder explanation for the next video when we start its programming. 
I have actually replicated the circuit in the breadboard right now and I have checked all the shorts and uh, all the circuits uh, separately that means the DC heater, AC heater, everything is working fine and all the connections are completely okay. Hey, thank you for watching the video guys. I know that the video got a bit too long but I really wanted to finish the schematic in this one video and then move on to the programming part in the next. I've actually prepared this whole circuit on the breadboard and I thought I could uh, show you how it works but then the video is getting too long so I will save that for the next video. In the next video we will start by programming the incubator and uh, I will introduce to you each and every component and how they work. So if you have any questions or you want to ask or suggest something you can do so in the comments and I will see you in the next video.